Torsten, we are speaking English in this course now. Do you know that? Yes. You know? Great. <laughs> yeah, you have to answer me. Yeah, you can speak Norwegian. I can speak English. Yeah, the reason is a student from Belgium, Jenka, she seems to want to have this course. So in order for her to understand what we talk about, we are speaking in English. Um, presently, we are... Uh, Running through previous exams, preparing for the exam. We have finished uh, the general lectures. They are available on Hemoldex, all of them. So if you want to catch up, you can go home now and start watching all lectures. Okay? And you can stay here, and we will uh, carry on <laughs> looking at the exam exercises. So, do we have any questions before we start? No, I think most of the other students here feel that this is a kind of medium complex course. Perhaps not too hard, perhaps not too easy. It depends on the exercises you get, don't it? Yeah, normally I give easy exercises, so as long as you try to read what is read then try to follow the lectures, I think it should be a reasonable chance of passing the exam. There is always some relatively easy questions. Sometimes some, some not so easy, but you need to, to have a certain feeling for this course, I think. Okay, uh, a small change in the plans. Okay, today is uh, lecturing today and tomorrow. Um, I told you there will be a guest lecture next Tuesday. I think that one actually takes place on Monday next week. So the final lecture in this course will actually be the coming Monday. Then Sandra Koffer will give a le guest lecture. I will not be here because I am present elsewhere, I think. So the final lecture with me will be tomorrow. Okay? I can put this up on Tronte, so in case somebody wants to be here ask me questions or whatever. Of course I'm... You know where I'm sitting? One floor up, all the way south, all the way east, at the corner office. 230 something, 31 maybe, 32. We will see. If you need to contact me, I'm always here. Uh, we can find that out, can't we? Maybe we should put on this one. Sorry about that. I thought it was on, which it wasn't. We just have to wait a few minutes now to, to make it pop up here. Uh, okay, okay. Let me put in a message here. New message, last lecture on Monday, what is Monday, the coming Monday, today is the 17th, is it? So it should be the 24th then, 4th of November, last, uh, Sandra. If you will give a guest lecture on Monday the 24th, the day after the cup final, isn't it? Uh, which will be the last lecture in this course. I finish my lectures on Tuesday. The 18th if anyone wants wants to talk with me before Yeah. 
Very good, Tina. Thanks a lot. Of November. And I will give a guest lecture on Monday the 24th, which will be the last. Uh, maybe we should have a comma here. We should be the last lecture in this course. I finished my lectures on Tuesday the 18th. Some I will be on campus in Monday the SPA. Yeah, okay, this is good. We store that one. Okay. Yeah, you know they're being taped? Yeah. I, I just need to inform in case anybody wants to leave. Um, exam. We looked at this one from 2009 last time. So the plan now is today and tomorrow to kind of finish these three remaining ones and then that's the end. Okay. So let's uh, move uh, directly until into <coughs> 2010 and have a look. As I also said last time, and I also put in the front here, uh, the exam uh, will be both in Norwegian and in English, Okay, so you can choose what you would like. Of course you can choose whether you want to answer in Norwegian or in English, that's up to you. I assume most of the Norwegians will both have a Norwegian exam as well as answer in Norwegian, but of course you're free to, to choose. There will be no difference in the judgments based on the, of course, based on the choice of language. Okay. So here is this exam from 2010, and it starts with something that should be a relatively simple question. Explain the concepts mixed and pure strategies in game theory. And the answer to that should be relatively short. You could write something like, for instance, um, a pure strategy means that the player in a game chooses either to do this or to do that. Okay. So in an equilibrium or in a Nash equilibrium or whatever you like to call it, then it means that uh, specific strategies are a part of this equilibrium. A mixed strategy, however, is a strategy where the player, instead of choosing a strategy as how to react, chooses a probability among a set of strategies. Okay, so it's about choosing this probability instead of choosing the strategy when you kind of find the Nash equilibrium. We have discussed this uh, in many ways basically in this course. It has some mathematical consequences and so on. If you really want to try to push your limits of course you can start discussing this but uh, an A answer here would be just what I said. We can look at the solution here. Move one up here and go in here. Now I have the exam here and the solution there. Okay, that's good. The solution says a mixed strategy means that the players in the play are allowed to choose among their possible strategies through a probability density. And then I put in parentheses, which is kind of concept which often is used, randomizing. If any of these probabilities in equilibrium leads to values of 1 or 0, then that is pure strategy. So this is kind of a different way of explaining it than the first I did. Okay, there are two options. I, uh, maybe my first explanation was better. But the point is to kind of get into these probabilities, okay? You open up for kind of finding a certain probability instead of finding the strategy. So a pure strategy a Nash equilibrium in a pure strategy means that the player decides what strategy to use. Okay? If you think about a penalty kick, that could mean that the player who takes the penalty decides to shoot in the middle of the goal. Always. Okay? That's a pure strategy. However, if he does what he should do, understanding a little bit of game theory, he should try to vary his shots. Sometimes shoot in the middle, sometimes shoot. And to kind of decide how to do this, he tries to find this probability, which kind of maximizes his expected payoff. And given the probability, of course, then he kind of draws from a hat or whatever on what to do when it comes to actually firing the shot. Okay, questions? Sometimes I give these questions like question B here where I kind of put up some allegation, post on in Norwegian, and I 
then I write something. It may be crazy sometimes, sometimes it's not crazy, sometimes in, in the middle between crazy and not crazy. And, and your task as a student then is to kind of try to understand it and try to put it into a context of the course you have had. So the allegation this time is, and I try to translate, a penalty kick executor in football should always place his shot where he is most secure on hitting the goal. Now if he is most secured on hitting the goal, that means that there must be a certain place where he is most certain. Of course it could be several places, but in general I would expect that the normal way of interpreting this is that if you are kind of executing on penalty kicks and try to pinpoint the place where you are certain to hit the goal, uh, then that means that you will shoot at the same place every time. And the comment I'm looking for here and is kind of to identify this as not the strategy we have found in the course. Okay, because in the strategy we found in the course, one should randomize. In right shooting sometimes there, sometimes other places. Okay? This kind of allegation does not construct these kind of strategies. Right? So, so given what we have learned in this course, this is not a sensible allegation. One should not do this. Okay? So in a sense this is a wrong allegation. It's not correct. Okay? But of course it's not correct given our models. And uh, of course to kind of answer sensibly or correctly you should put that as a kind of appendix here. Given or starting with given our assumptions of a mixed strategy Nash equilibrium in a penalty kick, this kind of allegation does not correspond with that. Okay, so consequently this is not a good choice. Okay, then there is a figure on the next page which represents a game theoretical model of a penalty kick situation in football. Here P is the probability of a goal given strategic choices WW for the players while Q uh, denotes the probability that the executor misses the goal given that he or she chooses the strategy W. So this is kind of, um, given that you remember the textbook now, this is the exact same model as we went through in the textbook. The figure is here and kind of everything is put into it. Okay, so this is presumably a correct figure. Okay, there is no kind of question here whether this is sensible or not. This is kind of how it should be. And it says under the figure text here, penalty kick as a simultaneous game. Then there is some questions here. Explain the meaning of the strategies W and M, which are a part of the figure here. There is W there and M there and M there and W there, for both keeper and executor. So the meaning of this question is that I would like you just to, to write some sentences what this really means. Okay, and if you remember back to the model, this W has different meanings for the executor and the keeper. The same has M, hasn't it? Because the W for the executor means how he shoots. Okay, it means that he shoots wide, either in one corner or, or in the other corner. The M strategy for the executor means that he shoots in the middle of the goal. There was a penalty kick yesterday in the middle of the goal, wasn't it? What kind of match was that? I seem to recall, but I, I forgot it. It was not the Maltesian penalty, because that was very nicely put in the... There was another team that... Ah, I have forgot. Doesn't matter. Okay, and of course, for the keeper's point of view, it's not about shooting, it's about how, how he kind of moves, okay? So the keeper could either move to one side or the other side. We put that in one strategy, W for the keeper. Okay? So W means for the keeper either going right or left. While M for the keeper means standing still. Okay? So that is the answer I would like on question C. Did I drop question B? No, I didn't. 
And then in D explain also the meaning of circles and squares which are given around some of the elements in figure one. Okay, if we now immediately look at figure one, of course there is certain squares around here, but it's these circles and these squares I'm trying to put your notion on. And you should explain what why we had why they are put the, the where they are and what they are. And uh, to, to kind of know that answer, you need to have uh, read some game theory here and kind of either understood it or put it in your head. And uh, both these circles and squares are best reply functions. And the circles are best reply functions for the executor, while the squares are best reply functions for the keeper, the two players of this game. So that is the answer to that question. Okay. Now we have kind of moved into A, B, C, and D. And there is a total of questions here O, E, F, and G. Okay? So we have kind of answered four out of seven subsec questions in this exercise. And these four questions should be reasonably easy to answer, in my opinion. It should not be very difficult, given that, of course, that you know and have read and have prepared good for this course. And if you're able to kind of have that percentage on each exercise, you will pass without problem. Okay. That would typically give you a C. Okay. Of course, then when we move on here, it becomes slightly more difficult. It's another question we shouldn't forget here. Has this game any Nash equilibrium and pure strategies? And the answer to that is no. But of course, I would suggest that you just not only write no, okay? You should write no because there are no circle and square in the same subsquare here, okay? In order to have a pure strategy in Nash equilibrium, for instance, this circle must be here. In that case, we have one there. But you see, there is no situations here where we have both a circle and a square in these four subsquares. Consequently, there are no Nash equilibria in pure strategies. Again, of course, if you remember the penalty kick, the whole point there was that the Nash equilibrium should be in mixed strategies, and of course then you should always get these kind of ones. Here. Okay, let's move to question E. Assume now that the following assumptions, uh, one, meaning these ones, are given for the probabilities P and Q. And we assume here that both P and Q neither are allowed to be zero nor are allowed to be one. That's kind of what this means, because the probability is always between zero and one, so the demands here kind of restricts these intervals slightly. We take out one and zero for both of them. Okay, that's kind of the meaning of them. And then we should give a practical interpretation. Basically, what does this mean? Maybe then it's a good idea to go back and look at the meaning of P and Q, because they are defined above here, aren't they? It says here that P is the probability of a goal given a WW for the players. Okay. So if P equals zero, this uh, executor must be bad. Okay, then there is never a goal if he shoots white and the keeper goes away. Or alternatively, the, the keeper is extremely good because he saves all, s all shots in a W double situation. Remember, a W double means that the executor shoots to one of the sides and the keeper throws himself to one of the sides. Okay? That's the kind of situation that opens up for a save in our model. But if P equals zero, then there is no goal, okay? Because the p is the probability of a zero. So if p equals zero is no goal, p equals one, one means that there is no saves. Always goal. Both these two situations are peculiar, okay? Both situations would make penalty kicks silly. Okay. Either there is always goals or no goals. Okay. In that case, you don't need to take a penalty kick, do you? Because you know the answer anyway. So that is, of course, the reason why we kind of rule them out. Okay, they don't kind of make a penalty kick interesting. The same kind of thing happens for this Q here. It has a different meaning. It is also defined here. It means that uh, Q 
Q gives the probability that an uh, executor misses the goal given that he shoots white. So if Q equals zero, he never misses the goal. That is perhaps something we can accept. The other one is perhaps harder. Q equals to one means that he always misses the goal if he shoots white. Okay. There are not any interesting penalty kick executors who are that bad. So that is the practical interpretation of these demands. We cannot rule out these four possibilities. Okay. Either always a goal if you shoot wide, or no goal if you shoot wide, or either always hit the goal if you shoot wide, or always miss the goal if you, if you shoot wide. So that is the practical interpretation. Okay, um, I want you to kind of transform these probabilities into reality. What do they really mean? What consequences do they have for the game? Okay, that was question E. Then there is a slightly more tricky one. Okay, it says show that the demands one. Now, given that these holds we should show that the best reply functions, circles and squares in figure 1 are what they are given us here. So then we need to look into some inequalities, don't we? What I'm asking you to do, to do now is to show that, okay, 1 minus q should be larger than 0. Okay, that is what comes out of this circle, isn't it? The definition of a best reply function for the executor is that this one should be bigger than this one if the circle is here and this one should be bigger than this one if the circle is there. Okay, so now we need to show that 1 minus q is positive and we also need to show that 1 is bigger than p times 1 minus q. Okay, and uh, there is an, uh, one here. Th that one is easy, isn't it? 1 is bigger than 0, so that is not a problem. That one is okay already. Okay. This one is easy to show as well, isn't it? If we move Q on this side, then we get one bigger than Q, don't we? Just by moving it to the right hand side, changing the sign. And this is also given here, isn't it? It says here Q less than one. So that's also okay. So what about this and the final one? The final one is this compared to that. Okay. 1 minus p times 1 minus q should be larger than q according to the square around this one. means that that one should be bigger than that. That's what I've written. So we, we need to, to look into this one and this one okay, to make sure that they are correct. This one is relatively easy p is a number which is bigger than 0 and smaller than 1. 1 minus q is the same type of number, isn't it? If q is less than 1, then 1 minus q is also less than 1, and of course always larger than 0, as is it's a probability. So here we multiply two numbers. Both numbers are bigger than 0 and smaller than 1. That means when we multiply, let's say, 1 third times two-fifths, of course, we end up with a number which is smaller than one, don't we? And that's what we wanted to do. So as you multiply two numbers smaller than one with each other, the result will become smaller than one. What about this one? So this one is also okay. Now this one we can uh, do a little calculation so on, actually. And these calculations are made in the textbook, so of course if you remember this, this should be no problem. Still, if you don't remember it, it's possible to try to solve it and see, see whether it seems reasonable. So if we just calculate here, p times 1 is p minus p times minus q is plus pq bigger than q, isn't it? Just calculating in the parentheses here. Maybe I should sit here. Uh. Now if you take this one, move it to the right hand side, what do we get then? 
that is we get 1 minus p on the left hand side should be larger than q minus pq now we have taken this one moved it to the right hand side change the sign to minus plus to minus you can re rewrite this as q is a common factor here isn't it we factor this one putting q outside then we get 1 minus p so now you see we get the same factor here and given our assumptions that this expression never will be negative p is in still in this interval so it can never be bigger than one and always bigger than zero of course this number is always positive then we can reduce this and end up with one bigger than q or q less than one which we already know is correct First ten, are you struggling? Yes. You are? Okay, you need to read the textbook here. But you know, this is, uh, now we are at sub-question F, aren't we? Yeah. yeah. So it's a question about your ambitions, okay? What I, I say to you, if you, if you do an effort here, you, you will pass this course with a very high probability. I can't guarantee you an A, okay? But you can surprise me. Yeah. It's up to you. Okay, that was question F. Then it seems very ugly here. The formula 2 below here, which is a big one. Uh, there is a, this peculiarity about students when they look at mathematics. They have this, you, you get this feeling that the students feel that if a formula is big, then it's more complex if it than if it's small. That is, of course, not the case. It has nothing to do with that. Of course, it may be more complex to kind of handle the formula, but the point of a formula is to be used for something. Okay, it perhaps takes a little, a few moments longer to calculate on a big than a, than a small one, but in principle, it's the same. Okay. So we have this formula, and it says the formula provides a Nash equilibrium in mixed strategies for the play the game in figure one okay here our star denotes the probability that an executor chooses the m strategy so r star is this one corresponding to this value here okay so this is the probability that the executor chooses to shoot in the middle of the goal while s star which is the other part of this comma in between this one provides the probability that the keeper chooses the m strategy so if we're able to put values into this p and q here then we will get two percentages okay two numbers 0 0.2 and 0 0.3 for instance whatever these numbers then tells us the game theory prediction of this game okay that would be that 20 percent of the shots would be shot in the middle while 30 percent or keeper actions would be to stay in the middle, okay, if it's 0 0.2, 0 0.3. And then we have given some information in G here. Assume now that Q goes to 1. Q becomes very near 1. How would you interpret this information related to the executor's abilities in that of shooting penalties? Utilize this information in equation 2 and interpret the consequences for the Nash equilibrium. When I write utilize this information, then what I really mean then is just that you can simply enter q equals 1 into this expression and calculate it. Okay, that's the meaning. So let's start there. Okay. G. Q equals 1 into equation 2. Okay, then we have to put q in equals 1 into it. Then Let's start on the left here, 1 minus p times 1 minus, no q is 1, so we can put it in 1 there, minus 1 over 2 minus p times 1 minus 1 minus 1. Okay, now we have entered q equals to 1 into the first part of 2. So let's stop there and move into the second part later on. So what happens here? 1 minus 1 is 0, isn't it? p times 0 is 0. Anything multiplied by 0 is always 0. So 
what's left on top here is 1 minus 1 which also is 0 so we end up here with 0 on top of this fraction okay. what happens on the bottom here 1 minus 1 is 0 p times 0 is still 0 so this expression is 0 but here is 2 minus 1 that provides 1 doesn't it so this is what we end with 0 divided by 1 how much is that Christian? Hopefully zero, yeah. <laughs> that is actually zero. So we end up with a zero on the first point here. And of course we now do the same on the other part here. If you look at it, maybe we can take it directly here. This is one minus one. That is zero. Okay. P times zero is zero. So there but there is no minus one here. So there is a one left. So we have one on the top of the fraction. Under the fraction is the same as previously, okay? So this one holds. So in this case, it's one over one. And one over one is one, isn't it? So we end up with this expression. And this means, if you are to interpret the Nash equilibrium, that our mixed strategy Nash equilibrium in this case ends up being a pure strategy Nash equilibrium, doesn't it? I said that now because there is 0 and 1 here it means that none of the shots from the executor goes in the middle of the goal all shots goes wide okay so he decides completely to shoot wide there is no randomizing left and the keeper he does not throw himself after the ball at all he stands still and the reason is straightforward okay what happens here when q goes to 1 the interpretation of this is that this executor is very bad, isn't it? Q, what's the probability of something? Let's go back and look at it. Q is the probability that the uh, executor misses the goal. So if that probability is 1, he always misses the goal, isn't it? That's the meaning of this information piece here, okay? So this is uh, an executor who always misses the goal if he shoots wide. But the Nash equilibrium here tells us that he will always shoot wide. Does you find that? Do you find that crazy? So why would an executor who always misses the goal always shoot in a way that he misses the goal? The reason is, of course, that our assumptions of the model here is that if the keeper stands, he locks the goal if the shooter shoots in the middle. Okay. So in that case. By standing, the keeper stops all possible goals. And at the same time, of course, the keeper knows that the executor is so bad that you just let him shoot wide, then he misses the goal. Okay, there will be no goals. Uh, this is the kind of answers you may get in game theory, okay? They seem paradoxical, but if you think about them, they are really not. And I try to give you some kind of explanation. And I try to look at this example. When you see these penalty shootouts, in big championships, typically England. Okay. We have all seen these English players when they pass the four or five or six first penalties who shoot bad penalties. Okay. They shoot wide, they miss the goal, they hit the post, the keeper saves whatever. Okay. This is kind of, uh, of course, this is to the extreme. But this is kind of what you would expect in those situations. And, uh, and uh, if you, at any point, are engaged in the penalty, kick competition and are not, um, don't feel that you're very good in taking penalties always shoot it in the middle of the goal and that is something you can learn here okay. of course as hard as you can either low or high not in the middle that's uh, a bad strategy okay. normally the keeper will take it then okay this was the first exercise again I said E, F and G may be a little bit tricky but given that you have read the text it should be straightforward okay or at least if you have read and understood and remembered the text. That is an uh, important thing. Then we move to exercise two. Compare handball and football in a game theoretic perspective. Can such a perspective explain the differences in popularity between these two sports? And this should be a straightforward answer in a sense, given that you want to reflect the content of the textbook 
because there is some discussion about this topic there. And the main idea is that uh, handball is a team game where a lot of the strategic space is killed through the rules. In handball, you cannot play passively. There is a small field. There is a limited number of players. There is only allowed to run three steps with the ball. And all these rules, they limit the strategic richness of the game a lot. Meaning, basically, that it's more probable to find, if you pick two handball matches at random, there's a bigger probability that they would resemble each other than if you pick two football matches at random. Okay? Because football doesn't have these limitations. And it's a strategically very rich game, okay? very complex game. Handball is far less complex due to the rules, which kind of narrows down what can happen. Because if you can't play pass passively, kind of half of the game is vanishing. Okay. If you look at football matches, the important matches at high levels, you will see that uh, a fair amount, amount of the time, either one of the teams play passively. Okay, they try to defend themselves. Of course. You try to defend yourself in handball as well if, if the opponent attacks. But in football, you can actually, in your own attack, choose to play defensively, play the ba ball back and so on. Okay. You probably saw Norway lot yesterday. Did you see Norway yesterday? They, they played kind of defensively the whole second half, actually, which uh, to the commentators seemed a bit, um, they were kind of uh, surprised a little bit, it seemed. But we who understand football were not surprised of that one, really, because, of course, the, the value of these three points became extremely high. Perhaps not due to the victory itself, but as long as Bulgaria drew that other match, then, of course, the road to being number three in the group is wide open. Now you can draw Bulgaria. You can even lose against Italy and Croatia in the three remaining matches, as long as you beat Malta and Bulgaria. And, uh, and, uh, uh, Azerbaijan at home, you have the third place. Unless something peculiar happens. That Bulgaria suddenly beats uh, Croatia and uh, Italy in their next, uh, in two or three of those matches. So from a kind of uh, planning point perspective, this what happens yesterday, this victory over Azerbaijan became extremely important because it, it kind of did what some of the commentators said in the previous match that Norway had kind of the grip of this third place. No, they have the grip after yesterday's matches. They didn't have that after the previous matches. Okay, I'm moving away from the exercise now. Am I not? Sorry about that. But the point here was straightforward. Strategic riches in handball is should be much smaller. And if you look at, as we did when we looked at this in the textbook, Picking some handball examples on these leagues and looked at uncertainty outcome, we saw that kind of the, the numbers were clear that, for instance, female Norwegian handball has a very low uncertainty outcome, which in general is not assumed good for a sport. Okay? If you know in relative certainty what will happen, why should you do then go and watch the match? What's the point of that? There must be some excitement, some thrill there. Okay, then let's move to B. As you know, that you are given the task of making a suggestion which can increase the popularity of handball by making changes in the rules. Make such a suggestion and state reasons for your answers. This is a question which, which really doesn't have an answer in the textbook. Okay, this is something you will have to be creative on, on the exam here. And we discussed it slightly, didn't we? Of course, in the framework we have discussed here, the point we are trying to launch here is that handball is kind of not strategically rich enough due to some problems, due to small pitch, few players, three-step rule, passive play. Okay. The first thought then should be, could, could we do something about this? Of course we can do something about the size of the pitch. We can increase the number of players. Both these two means would lead to a more rich strategic 
play in handball. Alternatively, we could make the goals bigger or maybe smaller. We can make the pitch bigger without increasing the number of players. Or we could make the pitch smaller without increasing. Uh, there's a lot of options here, okay, that will kind of disturb the, the, the play we know today. But maybe the, the most important and signif significant parts here, the three step rule and the passive play, are perhaps harder to fix, aren't they? We cannot allow passive play in handball. And the reason is straightforward. Okay, if we do that, then you would expect the game as follows, okay? One of the teams starts with the ball, they get the goal, and then each time they get the goal, they, they start. So if they don't get the goal against in the next attack, then they can start throwing to each other. And as you probably know, it's very hard to catch the ball. Although we see instances late in matches where they try to catch it, and they sometimes even do it. So. But I have a feeling that the reason is that these handball teams have no experience, no training in actually playing defensively. And of course, the reason why this rule came up in the first place, in the old days, was that if you allowed passive play, then these kind of games were killed easily. But of course, there is options of kind of allowing certain kinds of passive play. Today, the judges kind of blow the whistle when they feel that there has been enough passive play. And of course, in handball, passive play is typically done on your opponent's half of the pitch, not your own. Okay? Instead of trying to get the goal, you just throw the ball back and front, uh, in front of this wall of defenders. So one option there could be, like you have in basketball, for instance, to say, okay, maybe we should time this. Okay, say so you're allowed to play passively in, let's say, a minute, one and a half minute, two minutes, okay? Because then you make some kind of open up for the teams to speculate in this in another way than today. Because today, when the judges define what is passive, you can be blown off relatively fast, okay? especially if the situation is in such a way that the judges interpret these very easily as passive play. But if you have a kind of time limit, then you can start speculating. Then you know that, OK, I'm allowed to play passively for one and a half minute. Then we do that, given that we leads by a goal or two or three or four or whatever. And then, of course, you can speculate in the way that you, you play passively for one and a half minute, and uh, at the exact ending point, you make a nice attack and score a goal. Okay. And of course, that's what they do, isn't it? Or at least they try to do that. Okay. If Norway leads against, let's say, Hungary in the uh, Olympic final, okay, they lead by five goals, there is five minutes left. <coughs> this is exactly what they try to, to have long attacks, as long as they're allowed to, and then try to make a goal in the very end. The problem in, in today's rules is that you, you cannot kind of predict how long it takes. And of course, the closer you are to the end, and the, the bigger your lead is, in a sense, the, the shorter the duration of the passive play is what you should expect. And this is kind of tricky to, to utilize. Yeah, but here you can, you can, uh, you can say uh, almost anything here, OK? But uh, I think the key is to kind of introduce a little bit more passive play. This three-step rule, you could, of course, say, OK, we can have a four-step rule. But if you have an infinite step rule, it's crazy, because then you just put the ball and run, OK? You put it under your here and you run. As, as long as you cannot tackle as in American football, <laughs> this, is, uh, this will end at least in a, in, in a goal scoring chance. So that rule is perhaps harder. But of course, you could test with the two steps or four steps, five steps, see what happens. A four step rule would uh, mean uh, some kind of advantage for the attacking team. But mainly in order to kind of achieve that a bad team should win against a good team. That's kind of what we want, OK? Then it's more important to introduce more options on the passive side, on the defensive side. So I think the most important part here is to, to, to look into the option of introducing more defensive play in, in handball. And it, this is kind of basically in all these other team sports, in ice hockey, in volleyball, in basketball, in all these kind of team sports where playing defensively either is illegal or very difficult and dangerous. If you look at the team ranking in international ice hockey, you will see that during the last 50 years, there's been Russia, Canada, United States, Sweden, Finland, and the Czech Republic. These six teams 
have been, I would expect, among the five highest rankings in the last 50 years. This is not much uncertainty outcome, is it? Still, of course, the sport seems to be slightly popular. Of course, not very popular. There isn't even a, a ice hockey stadium in Molde, is it? But we have a very nice football stadium. That tells something, doesn't it? Yeah. Okay, time for a break. We finished one e exam. Uh, no, we finished not everything. There is one exercise left here. Exercise three. Okay, we we'll, uh, we'll look into that in the next hour. There is a chess match today, isn't it?